G'day, Bruce here, Barking Dog Bim. You may have previously seen me use the statement that goes call axes. And natural flow on questions from that would be, well, what is that? What do you use it for? How can I get one of those myself? If you haven't seen me previously use that statement, you'll be wondering, what are you talking about? Well, if you fall into either of those two categories, you're in luck because I'm about to tell you. Stick around, useful information coming your way. So I've fired up ArchiCAD and I have applied my GDL work environment profile, which turns on the edit GDL library parts toolbar, which is this toolbar here. It also makes sure that under options, work environment, model rebuild options, my interrupt with error messages is turned on. So that way I get the correct feedback that I'm looking for with print statements and error statements as well, error handling. You can open the GDL reference guide under gdl.graphisoft.com and click on reference guide. And the PDF version can be found under help online resources and GDL reference guide. You can either view it online or download your own copy. I've downloaded my own copy and I'm viewing it in my PDF viewer of choice, which is Bluebeam. So the first question, what is it? I'll open the object using this button here, open object, or I can go file, libraries and objects, open object, I would then need to navigate to where I have it stored in my libraries. An alternative way is if I start a new object, clicking that button there. Alternatively, I could have gone File, Libraries and Objects, New Object. I'll restore down using this button up the top right here. Restore down. On a Mac, it's right click on the tab and choose Undock. I'll open a 3D script window. And for this one, I'll also open a 3D view window. If I type in here call axes, what I can do is I can highlight that text and I can open it just by clicking on this button here or using the shortcut or again, going up to my file menu option. And what that will do, ArchiCAD will find that object and open it for me. So I don't have to find it in my folder structure. So what this object is, it's just three lines with arrows on it as a sort of indication of where my axes are. Red for X, green for Y, blue for Z, as is convention amongst nearly all 3D packages. It also has a corresponding 2D view. Red for X, green for Y, and it has and X marks the spot for the origin and hotspots and hotlines that I can snap to. So that's what the object is. You've probably figured out that call is what is referred to as a macro call. And what that does, it's fancy scripting terminology for basically saying, toddle off, find this object and run it. And you'll find that under the help, control statements, macro objects, call. And you can see that the command is call and then the string of the object, the name of the object. So this isn't a video about the complexities of using a call statement. It's just that's what it's doing. It's running off, running this axis. Now with a call statement, it will run the script of the called object from whichever script it's called from. So if I call that object from my 3D script, it will run off to axes, run that 3D script, first running the master script because the master script runs before any of the other scripts, and then come back to this script that I'm in. If I place this in the 2D script, it'll run off, run the master script and the 2D script of the object that I'm calling. It won't run the parameter script unless I call the object from the master script. If I call it from the master script, it'll run off and run that entire object. Remembering, of course, that parameter scripts don't run unless the parameter dialog is opened from the object in the floor plan or a parameter is changed through 
stretching the object or changing the parameter in the info bar, something like that. So that's what it is. Why would I use it? All right, well, let's close that. We've got a new object here. Let's have a look at our 3D view. Nothing in it at the moment. So let's just put something in here. So we've got something to look at. We'll just use the prism statement, not prism underscore. Is it simpler? We'll have four coordinate points. We'll make the height z, z, y, z, x. We'll make our first x coordinate zero and zero. And because it's the prism statement and not the prism underscore command, there's no status code. It will assume a status code of 15. So if you have a quick look here, 3D shapes, basic shapes, prism. We draw our base polygon and extrude it to H height using n number of coordinate points. And if we have a look at status codes, we'll see that 15, now these are a side view of your extruded prism. Side view will draw the leading edge, bottom and top edge, and the surface. So that's what we're doing here. Zero, zero, then we'll go across in the X direction to A, and we'll still be at zero. We'll be at A for the third point, but we'll go up to B, and then we'll come back to zero, but still be at B. There's our four points. Let's have a look at our 3D view. There's our box. I'll just shift these tabs down to the end. That's how I like to organize it so I can navigate through my file nice and easily. And we'll change some of these parameter values just so that it's a little bit easier to see what we're working with instead of just a cube. Right, that's better. I'll also give it a bit of a lighter color. So we'll change its material. We'll hard code it, which is bad practice, but for this example, that will do. There we go. There's our beige box. Right. When you're developing an object of any complexity that has any number of transformations in its transformation stack, now transformation is a 3D or 2D cursor transformation using the commands add for add, rote for rotate or mull for multiply and they have both their 3D and their 2D counterparts. If you use any number of those transformations to get your object or your text wherever it needs to be, it can get confusing as to where the cursor is at any given time because there's no real feedback for that. So that's when I use my axes object. So let's demonstrate that. Now in our 3D view, you do have the option to turn on these axes that are part of the 3D view. You've got your G and your L down here, standing for global and local coordinate systems. Your global is your zero, zero, zero point. That will always stay there. And your local will show where your cursor is at the completion of the script. So not partway through, when the script is fully run and produced its 3D view, or 2D view if you happen to be doing that, it will show you where that cursor is. So it's only really useful to see if you've properly cleared your transformation stack. So let's have a look. We'll go add and we'll add half an A in the X. At the moment, we'll just go zero and zero for the Y and the Z. And you can see the L has moved off half an A and the coordinate system has stayed there. Let's just move it half a B as well. And we'll move it half a Z, Z, Y, Z, X. Right, so there's our cursor. So far, so good, right? Let's add in a rotation. We'll go rotate around the Y and let's say 30 degrees. It's rotated, drawn our box. Let's add another rotation, a rotation around the X, 45. Very good. It's rotated around there. And finally, let's add a multiply of minus one, which is essentially mirroring the object. Oops should be a mul x. There we go. Mul x. Again, you can see that the cursor or the local axis is correctly showing where the axis is at the completion of my script. At the moment, it corresponds with where the box is drawn, but good script discipline. And what you should always be doing is clearing your transformation stack at the end of your script. So I've got four transformations here. I will delete those four transformations. My L returns 
back to my global system and now I have no idea what I've done. But again, this local coordinate axis is good, but only at the completion of your script. It doesn't give me the capacity to figure out where I may have gone wrong or where the cursor is at any given moment in my script. So that's where the call axis comes into play. So I'll go call axis. It used to be that this was case sensitive but it no longer is. I'm 27, so I can go call axes and it'll still work. So 26, this will be case sensitive. 27, no longer case sensitive. Anyway, so it's brought in my object here, red, green, blue, at the zero, zero, because I have no transformations happening. If I was now to move this statement down after my add statement here, there we go, it's showing where the cursor is after that transformation, showing its correct orientation, red, green, blue. Right, let's move it down another one. Right, showing its rotation at that instance in the script. Again, there we go. So I can place this anywhere in my script to figure out where my cursor is to figure out where I may have gone wrong in my transformations. Now, this is a pretty simple script. It's just to demonstrate what this does. So now you know what it is. Now you know why I use it. How do you get one of your own? Well, if we have a look at this axis, let's just pop it up here and I'll get rid of our box. If we have a look at it, you've got a line in each of the three axes. You've got an arrowhead on each of the ends. Let's turn that off too. And we've got a crosshair at the origin. And we have a corresponding 2D view. So let's get on with that. We'll use this same object. Right, so we'll leave it as a model element subtype. Model element subtype. Fill out the author, which is copyright. Now, if you want to know how I got that C in there, on a PC, it's hold down the Alt key, and on the number pad, type in 0169. You can also find it in your character map. So Alt 0169. Copyright. For a Mac, it is Option key G. We'll give you that. We'll give it a attribution, no derivatives, and that's put in our descriptions. Created by, they created, just put in a brief description of what it is. Now we'll leave it as placeable while we're developing it so we can see what's going on. But ultimately, this will not be placeable, which means that a user won't be able to find it in the object dialog. So when they come to place their object here, it won't appear in any of their searches or loaded libraries but other parts will be able to find it and use it. So it's that, parameters, we'll change these back to their defaults. We won't be using them, but we'll just change them back to their defaults. And we'll turn that off. I'll copy in some starter script, which is just basically in the master script, it's a commented header and a footer. And I just use this to get my thought processes going, help organize my scripts and give me further visual feedback or visual prompting as to which window I'm in. For example, I just pasted the master script in my 3D script window. So I want to go to my master script and paste it in there. Master script, 3D script, 2D script. So in our 3D script, what are we doing? We're doing a line with an underscore. That's the 3D command for a line, which you'll find under 3D shapes, planar shapes in 3D, and it's line. X1, Y1, Z1 to X2, Y2, Z2. So we'll do a line from 0, 0, 0. This is the X1, so it'll be across in, well, how far are we going to go? What is the size of our line? So I'll come to our master script and we'll create a variable called axis length, and we'll make that one meter long. I like to put in the trailing zeros just so it makes it easier to read it as a meter, because in GDL, links are in meters, not millimeters. So we'll go axis length, zero, zero. 
So this will be our x-axis. We'll need one for our y-axis. And we'll need one for our z-axis. Right, let's have a look at our results. 3D view. There we go. There's our three lines. There's no color to them and there's no arrows on the end yet. So what do we do first? Let's do the arrows on the end. Well, if we do an arrow, we're going to need an arrow size. I don't want to hard code the size into this. I want to use a variable to determine that. The rule of thumb is if you're going to use a dimension or a size in more than one location, create a variable for it. So we've got axis length. Let's go arrow I, and we'll make that 100 millimeters. We'll go arrow width, and we'll make that arrow high, and we'll divide that by four. So that way, proportionally, it'll stay the same regardless of how high my arrow will be if I decide to change it. And so after our end statement in the 3D script, so the 3D script will run down, and when it hits that end statement, it'll stop. But I can, in my script, jump down to lower places using subroutines. So we'll create a subroutine using a label, and we'll call it arrowhead. Every subroutine needs a return. So it's important when you create subroutines that immediately after creating the label, you put in the return so you don't forget it. Otherwise, you'll get an error. It can take you forever to try and figure out where you've gone wrong. So there we go. There's our subroutine. And the command we want to use is pyramid. And that is under 3D shapes as well, 3D shapes. But it's under shapes generated from polylines. Pyramid is the statement we're after. And here it is. Now that looks more complicated than we were hoping, right? But you can see it's very similar to the prism statement in that we define a base polyline and it extrudes it to a point. We can also offset that point. But for this case, all we're doing is a four-sided base extruded directly up. So here's our syntax pyramid, number of base points, height, mask will be the base surface is present, the closing surface is present, base edges are visible. So we'll want all of those. And then each coordinate line will have a status code. So the status code is zero to say that each edge is visible and one to say that they are not visible except when viewed from the side. I think that's what that means. Anyway, zero is what we want. And I've got an example here, how to go about it if you want to unpack that. But what we want is a simple pyramid with four coordinate lines, height of arrow high, mask of one plus four plus 16, which will show everything. Now, X coordinates, I'll just fill in these coordinates. So there we go. Because we're drawing this from the center, those are the coordinates that we need. So we've got our go sub in here, but we haven't called it yet. So on our X axes, now this is the line, this is this X axis up here. So what we want to do is we want to shift our cursor up to the end here, rotate it and draw our pyramid. At the moment, I will just shift it one. So you can see what happens. We'll go add X, axis length, and we'll go sub. And then we'll delete our transformation. So there we go, we've gone up here, we've drawn our pyramid like that. And our coordinates have come back to here to draw the axes. What we want to also do though, is we want to rotate it and we want to rotate it in the Y axis. We want our arrowhead pointing that way. So we'll rotate Y, make sure that we update our delete, delete two, wrong way. So we'll rotate that way, there we go. Now it's drawing it on the end of the line. You may want that, I don't. I want it to be the point to be at the end of my length. So we'll go axis length, go that way, and that should drop back to here. There we go. So we'll just do that for the others. So we'll be adding Y, and we'll be rotating in the X. Rotating the wrong way, so we'll go minus 90, 
There's that one. And we can see I've deleted all my transformation stack. That's good. And for the Z, we want to add the Z. And there won't be a rotation because it's already pointing in the right direction. So we update accordingly. There we go. Good. That's those. We need our colors now. Because I'm going to be using the pens in both the 3D and the 2D script, again, we'll go to the master script and we'll add our pens. We'll go pen X. Now, I don't know of any way to define a pen color in GDL independently to your pen tables. So you have to choose a pen from your own pen tables that corresponds to the color. And that's a shortfall, in my opinion, in GDL. You can define surfaces, you can define line types, you can define fill types, you can define just about every other attribute in line in GDL. You can't define pen colors, not to my knowledge. So red will be pen 221, green will be 227, blue will be 225. And now we put the set these pens before each of our axes. There we go, red, blue, and green. Now we can take this a step further. It has used the pen for the surface of our pyramid, but we can also set that surface in case the pens are incorrect. It goes to a file where it uses different pen tables. We can use an inline material independent of the project attributes to define our colors. That is under eight attributes, inline attribute definition, and surfaces define material. And again, it's very overwhelming to look at it, but we can break it down and simplify it. The command is define material. That's easy. Name. Well, that's easy. We can come up with that. Type. Well, what's the type? Well, the type is defined down here all these different things but let's just focus on one we'll make it number two matte that'll be fine so type will be two and then you've got surface red surface green surface blue those are your rgb colors and those are defined as a value between zero and one now i'm used to defining my rgbs as a value between zero and 255 not zero and one. And that's pretty standard, right? Because if you go to your pens, your pen colors, RGB is a value between zero and 255, not zero and one for us. But that's easy. In order to get the value you want, you divide it by 255. So let's have a look at what that looks like. We'll define our material. What was the command again? It was define material. Name will be Matt X. Type will be, what was it again? Type 2 for matte, remember? Type, type 2 matte. Surface red, we want this to be our red value. So it's going to be 255 divided by 255. Surface green will be 0 divided by 255. And surface blue will be, again, 0 divided by 255. The rest of it we don't need. Now you can delve into that if you want to define things for rendering and whatnot, but you don't need them for a simple definition of a surface. Define material, mat X, type two, those are our values. So now we will define our mat Y, and that will be full green, nothing of the others, and define our mat Z, which will be full blue. So we've defined our materials, we haven't used them yet. So you can see how this affects things. Let's change our pens to something wrong. So that's wrong. And let's change our materials up here. So we'll set a pen and we'll set our material. What was it? It was matte X for material. They're all red. It's mat Y for the Y axis and mat Z for our Z axis. There we go. So even though the pens are wrong, the colors are still right, giving you the correct visual feedback for what you wanted. All right, let's just change these back to what they're meant to be. Good. 
Okay, let's add a hotspot to the middle and a hotspot to the ends of these. And when we draw the pyramid, we will draw the hotspot. Zero in the X, zero in the Y. So I'll save that. Save it to an external location, not to an embedded location. If you save it to an embedded library, then if the file crashes or if you get into an infinite loop, you've lost your work. Now make the file name simple. I've called it BDB axes. You call it whatever you want, but you want it to be nice and simple so that it's very easy to use it in your scripts when you're trying to figure something out. Limit the friction it takes to put this line of code in. Let's place it. Select my object. It should be pre-selected up here, and it is. Put it down here. I get nothing, and the reason I get nothing is because I don't have a 2D script. So I'll undo my project 2 statement, my project 2 statement, and there we go. There is my axes. Now we'll do the 2D script in a minute. We're just looking at the 3D script for now. So I've got hotspot there, hotspot there at my points. So what I want to do now is add a crosshairs to this location here. So again, we'll add a crosshair length. Now, when you name your variables, it's important to use descriptive words. See, for crosshair length, I could go CHL, something like that. That's a little bit too cryptic. For people who do GDL, we are generally architects and draftees first, programmers second. So a good rule of thumb is to make your variables nice and descriptive. It reduces the number of interpretations you have to do in your head while trying to figure out your script. So instead of CHL, I'll go crosshair long. And we'll make that 10 millimeters long. We also need a pen for our crosshairs. Again, it's a line underscore statement. And this time we will start at, and we will finish at, that'll draw one line. There it is. And the other one will start at positive X, but still negative Y and finish at negative X and positive Y. There it is. Good. Save that by hitting Control S or this button up here, save. And under our 2D view, let's now develop our 2D script. The 2D script is basically just the 3D script adjusted for 2D. So we'll select, we'll select our script, copy it across to here, and adjust for 2D. So instead of hotspot, it's hotspot 2, and it only has two coordinates. I'll just comment out the script while I adjust it because I want to test midway through developing it. So X axes, set the pen, we won't need a material. Line underscore will not be line underscore, it will be line two, which doesn't have a Z coordinate. We will be adding two, not add X. Add X is a 3D command. So add two is what we need. And add two requires an X and a Y. We'll rotate, but we will rotate two, not rotate Y. And we'll go sub arrowhead and delete two. So down here under our arrowhead, first of all, we'll change this to hotspot two which only has two coordinates. And instead of a pyramid, it'll be a poly2 statement. Now, what does a poly2 need? If we have a look under our 2D shapes, drawing elements, poly2 requires number of coordinate points, frame fill, and an X and a Y for each coordinate line. Does not require a status code, like a poly2 underscore does. And for our frame fill, we we'll want to draw the contour. I do not want to draw a fill. I want to be able to see through it so it doesn't obscure the object I'm trying to develop. And we want to close an open polygon. So that will be one plus J3 equals four. So it'll be one plus four. So poly two, we're only drawing a triangle. It's three coordinates line. And it'll be one plus four. I'll just get rid of these and write them back in. So we're drawing a triangle. Like that, we want to start at minus, and this is our zero point at the base of the triangle. We want to start at minus arrow width, 
go across to plus arrow width, and then up to zero and arrow height. So X minus arrow width, plus arrow width, and then it'll be zero arrow high. Now, because we're drawing this at the base of our triangle, we want the hot spot to be at the tip. So we want to add, not in the X, but in the Y, arrow high, and then delete our transformation. Check our script. It's OK. We'll comment out this so we can see what the true result of our script is. And there it is. Going the wrong way. So we'll rotate that the other way. And I don't want that line to continue through there, so I'll go axis length minus. There we go, and it's red. I've changed enough that I'll just copy this down again, like so. Change what I need. There'll be no rotation for a Y. Excellent, and crosshairs. Okay, now in this 2D view, I also want to be able to select or have intelligent cursor feedback on these lines, axis lines. So I'll add in a hotline too on both of these as well, which is just copying your line statement and going hotline. The way that hotlines are indicated in your 2D view is it puts a little hotspot at the end of each line. So when I click in here, you'll see a crosshair appear here and here, indicating a hotspot. There and there. So that's been successful. All right, save that. And here is my axes with my three hotspots. Intelligent cursor feedback over the axes displaying how I want it to. So what we'll do now is create a preview picture. That preview picture can be whatever you like. In my case, it's just a snapshot of the 3D. I use Snagit, which is cheap and in my opinion, worth it. So I've removed the background, the white background, just copy that to the clipboard and under the preview picture, paste it from the clipboard into the preview picture. And there we go, PDB axes. And last thing we will turn off placeable. Save it, and there's your axes for use in your scripts. Now, just because I've turned off placeable, anything that has already been placed, you can still select, you can still see it, and it will show up. But if I now want to place a new one, it's not there. It's not there because it's not placeable. So there you go, told you I'd answer those three questions, told you useful information was coming your way. Go and script something. I'll see you next time.